Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Selamat sore dan selamat datang di Silaturahmi Merdeka Belajar kepada para sahabat Dikbud dan semua partisipan yang bergabung melalui Zoom dan juga yang menonton live e, melalui e, kanal YouTube Kemendikbud Ristek Republik Indonesia. Saya Iwan Syahril dan pada sore hari ini saya akan menjadi moderator untuk Silaturahmi Merdeka Belajar atau webinar yang akan kita lakukan pada saat ini. Sahabat Dikbud, pandemi pada saat ini memang masih belum berakhir. Jadi teruslah untuk e, menerapkan protokol kesehatan di kegiatan Anda sehari-hari. Nah, bagi yang bergabung e, melalui Zoom, e, silakan nanti e, sahabat Dikbud bisa menanyakan pertanyaan-pertanyaan dengan menggunakan fitur chat yang ada di e, kanal Zoom tersebut. E, sebelum kita mulai nih, e, kita ada di, e, dua tamu istimewa. Saya ingin sedikit menjelaskan terkait dengan tema kita pada sore hari ini, yaitu Uh, the importance of face-to-face -face learning in G20 countries atau pentingnya pembelajaran tatap muka pada ne di negara-negara G20. Uh, pada sore hari ini topiknya sangat berkaitan juga dengan kegiatan kita memimpin uh, presidensi G20 khususnya di bidang pendidikan. Nah, uh, kita sudah mengalami uh, krisis yang cukup lama, uh, bahkan sebenarnya krisis pembelajaran itu berlangsung sebelum pandemi ini uh, uh, menimpa kita semua. Dampak dari sosial ekonomi dari pandemik ini betul-betul telah memperparah tentunya krisis pembelajaran kepada anak-anak kita. Terutama mereka yang dari kelompok-kelompok yang lebih rentan. Mereka menghadapi resiko e, kehilangan pembelajaran atau learning loss yang e, jauh lebih besar. Nah, e, dalam upaya untuk mencegah penyebaran virus corona, kebanyakan negara-negara di dunia, bukan saja di Indonesia, menutup sekolah-sekolah mereka. Dan itu diperkirakan ada sekitar 1,6 miliar murid-murid seluruh dunia yang terdampak dari kebijakan penutupan sekolah tersebut. Untuk melanjutkan kegiatan-kegiatan pendidikan, beberapa negara menerapkan pembelajaran jarak jauh. Namun tentunya kualitas dari pembelajaran jarak jauh ini bervariasi dari satu negara dengan negara yang lain. Dan juga bukan hanya itu kualitas, tapi juga akses untuk mendapatkannya. Sehingga resiko dari learning loss ini, ini semakin uh, tentunya semakin perlu untuk kita uh, ha uh, handle bersama-sama. Nah, karena pandemi masih belum berakhir, uh, dan beberapa negara-negara termasuk negara-negara di G20 berupaya untuk bagaimana caranya mengatasi learning loss dengan mengakselerasi pemulihan uh, pembelajaran mereka, uh, tidak hanya dengan uh, untuk catch up, tapi juga Mem, bagaimana mengakselerasi bisa lebih cepat lagi sehingga kita menghindari bahaya learning loss. Salah satu strategi yang disepakati di negara-negara G20 adalah bagaimana kita bisa untuk kembali melakukan pembelajaran tatap muka di semua sekolah-sekolah. Jadi bukan hanya di Indonesia dalam konteks ini, tapi juga di negara-negara G20 dan juga dalam konteks global. Nah, di sekolah, murid-murid uh, dapat uh, mendapatkan uh, lingkungan belajar yang dapat mendukung mereka untuk bisa belajar dengan lebih baik dan berbagai studi telah menunjukkan bahwa memang pembelajaran tatap muka ini masih metode yang lebih baik bagi anak-anak uh, kita dan para pemuda kita secara umum. Nah, pada sore hari ini untuk kita bisa membicarakan lebih lanjut pentingnya pembelajaran tatap muka dalam konteks negara-negara G20 Silaturahmi uh, Merdeka Belajar akan mendiskusikan secara komprehensif dengan dua orang narasumber yang sangat kompeten. Uh, sahabat Dikbud, saya akan switch ke bahasa Inggris ya. Uh, nanti ada subtitle uh, yang muncul di uh, layar uh, sahabat Dikbud semua. Joining with me today is Mr. Han Xiao Chang, the Counselor of Education and Research, the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. Good afternoon, Mr. Han. And Miss Catherine Bennett, the Chief of Education, UNICEF. Good afternoon, Miss Catherine. Good afternoon, Pat Yuan. So, all right, let's get straight into the question. Um, first question to Mr. Han. Um, what steps uh, did Australia uh, implement to accelerate learning after face-to-face -face learning activities in schools were fully reinstated? Uh, selamat sore, Pak Yuan. Selamat sore, Pak Han. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, you and your ministry for inviting Australia and inviting me to be part of this very important discussion today. Um, you know, your work and your ministry's work throughout the, the G20 year has been fantastic 
and Australia is really looking forward to supporting Indonesia as part of its uh, presidency. Thank so, you. first of all, thank you very much. When we talk about face-to-face -face learning and the transition from remote to face-to-face -face learning, it is a very significant mm -hmm. step uh, as part of our transition mm -hmm. uh, and as we progress out of the pandemic. I know we're not out of it, but we're, we're, we're learning to, to learn to, to live with a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, we are going to look into ways to, uh, I guess, to address the issues around trying to accelerate that face-to-face -face learning. But perhaps I can paint a picture about the Australian education system so, so there is a bit of context in terms of what I'm about to say. So in Australia, our schooling system works under a federated system. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that states and territories, otherwise known as provinces in Indonesia, are actually responsible for the running of schools. Mm -hmm. So that means the delivery of the curriculum, mm -hmm. assessment and reporting are all undertaken by states. Mm. Yeah. The national government is responsible for you know, teaching and school lead leadership policies mm. uh, through an institute called the Australian Institute for Teaching uh, and School Leadership, mm. otherwise known as AITSL. Mm -hmm. uh, states are the majority funders of public schools and the national government are the majority funders of non-public schools such as uh, independent and faith-based organisations. In this uh, environment, uh, we have about 65% of our students going to public schools and the remaining not. So under this federated system, states and territories had their own policies around schooling. Mm -hmm. They also had their own policies around border restrictions and also health protocols. Oh, okay. So what happened in Australia was that we did not have one speed system. Mm -hmm. What we had was different states doing different things. And as we learned through the pandemic, uh, different states had different, I guess, uh, circumstances of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, in Victoria, Melbourne, they actually experienced one of the longest COVID lockdowns uh, across the globe. And I think the data suggests that in May 2021, only about two, three percent of Victorian students were actually in classrooms. Mm. At the same time, in the Northern Territory and Western Australia, they had a very high percentage of students doing face-to-face -face learning around May 2021. That was because mm. their COVID situation was a little bit different. Yeah. So that sort of paints the picture between uh, what states do and what the national government does, but also the intrinsic link between health and education, mm -hmm. which has been made, I think, closer mm -hmm. as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think that the first thing the national government is doing in relation to uh, going back to school is trying to get those health protocols right. Okay. So I think that's a very, very important part. There was no national approach to return to schools. As I said, states had their own things. But in 2022, what we did agree, both at the national and the state level, was that the principle of keeping schools open, because we did recognise the importance of face-to-face -face learning. Mm. So what we did was that um, at the National Council between state and national government, we agreed schools would be the first to open and last to close out of all institutions when it comes to COVID restrictions. So that was a great, and I think that was a fantastic step towards ensuring schools are the first thing that we prioritise when it comes um, to coming out of the, the COVID situation. The federal government um, provided uh, additional funding for implementing health and sanitation protocols mm -hmm. in schools, and that included uh, stuff like uh, regular uh, and free testing kits for, mm -hmm. for teachers and students. But they also relaxed some of the COVID restrictions uh, in terms of movements. So if you're a close contact, um, if you're a teacher or a student, mm -hmm. you are allowed to come back to school uh, if you don't have any symptoms and you test negative. Mm. So we did see a, a stronger connection between health and education in that regard. But moving on to the important piece, which is that education piece. I think Australia was a very, very lucky country. The education system demonstrated very significant amounts of resilience and agility throughout the period. 
students were still able to get access to high quality education and learning throughout the period. Mm. And so what we found, which was a surprise to us as well, is through the national testing, mm -hmm. student cohorts from the COVID years did just as good oh, really? as those students in pre-pandemic years. Mm -hmm. So evidence actually suggests there were no across the board learning loss. Mm -hmm. But again, that's across the board. There were certain segments certainly suffered. So uh, a report done by one of the states indicated that some of the disadvantaged schools actually suffered learning loss for about two months. But then that was also offset by some schools that actually accelerated their learning during that period. And that was because the discrepancy in terms of access to you know, infrastructure, to, to digital assets that made the difference uh, and also the, the resourcing around teachers that made the difference between you know, those more advantaged and less advantaged schools. But th there were a few things that we did in terms of trying to implement and trying to accelerate that face-to-face -face learning. Those things were actually focused on not so much the learning component, but around the well-being component. Mm. So one of the things we discovered was that there were um, very negative adverse impacts on the student and teacher well-being through the period, mm -hmm. through self-isolation, mm -hmm. through um, mm -hmm. well, the feeling of isolation, mm -hmm. and just their mental health. And, and so broadly, what the national government focused on was more of those health policies. Mm -hmm. So we, we provided additional funding for mental health support. <coughs> Some of the states also implement this tutoring program in which mm -hmm. we um, the teachers um, were offering tutoring for, for students for them to uh, catch up mm. on their learning. Mm -hmm. so, so it was quite health focused, but you know, one of the things that uh, less policy but more guidance was around how teachers can support students to get ingrained back into the system. One of the things they discovered was the, the students suffered from the well-being because there was a lot of uncertainty. It was, a, it was a feeling of helplessness. So the guidance for the teachers was around how can you implement more of a structure mm -hmm. and more of a routine for students in terms of their learning environment. Mm -hmm. Moving on to perhaps a, a longer piece, which is that long-term initiative. And, and that long-term initiative is around the quality of teachers mm -hmm. and the supply of teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue that will be ongoing, but is a very important piece mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. In Australia, um, we do have a shortage of teachers in certain fields, such as science and mathematics, but also in regional parts mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to entice those bright, mm -hmm. young, diverse groups, mm -hmm. those high-performing school leavers into the system. Mm -hmm. you know, so we are doing things on the longer term to address the quality mm -hmm. and, and the supply of teachers mm -hmm. in the system. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I mean, that's a, that was a pretty broad story, but um, I think the, the, the key takeaway is perhaps, you know, for us, it wasn't so much about learning loss. It was the well-being. Well-being. But that well-being component is such a big part of a student's journey right. in their education, you know, in, in their education piece. So the policies were health-focused, mm -hmm. but also providing resources for mm -hmm. teachers to, to do their job appropriately. And we know, Providing support for teachers and school leaders is the most important piece right now, and they probably need the support the most at this very critical junction. I see. Thank you so much, Mr. Ham. So, <coughs> when you mention about the uh, the health focus, uh, I just want to clarify: it's just not just in the federal government, but also the the state and territories, right? They 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 cooperate together between the health sector and education sector. Absolutely. Yeah. So under the federated system the health um, is also actually run by states. Okay. Um, so that actually worked out quite well with, with states running the, the health system as well as the schooling system, yeah. but always in collaboration uh, and always try to in lockstep with the national government. Mm. We know it'll never have a perfect marriage just because, you know, the political right. system itself, right. Right. but I think there was a, a broad recognition from a principal's perspective that we need to get kids back in schools. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Han. We need to 
get kids back in school. Uh, wow, that's a, uh, such a simple but I think the powerful uh, message um, that I think resonate with what we discussed also in G20. Um, what I learned just now is uh, how the uh, the health sector and education sector work together. And Mr. Han, uh, a couple of times mentioned about health focus. And another another uh, quote that I like is, uh, "Schools is the f schools are the first to open and last to close." I think uh, this is maybe something that uh, like uh, show the commitment mm -hmm. that how important uh, education is. Uh, instead of like schools is the the first to close and last to open uh, here in Australia is that schools are the first to open uh, uh, and then last to close it, it means the priorities for education is very very strong mm -hmm. thank you so much mr. Han I learned a lot also with the uh, how you uh, uh, organize the governance of education in mm. Australia It's very unique um, and also uh, now now let's move to miss Catherine Bennett um, how significant uh, is uh, the impact of learning loss? We talk about learning loss uh, quite a lot. Uh, and in G20, every country is worried about learning loss. And this is actually one of the, uh, the, 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 fun the foundation of our discussion because we're not thinking about uh, recovery, but we want to rebuild stronger. We want to reimagine the education system uh, and using this momentum, uh, but learning loss is so serious. Can you maybe uh, give us uh, some uh, illustration or explanation? How how significant is it for us to pay attention to this, especially when we think about the future? Yeah, thanks, Pat Yuan. I mean, in fact, in your opening, you kind of mentioned some very um, kind of scary um, global figures mm -hmm. as well in mm -hmm. terms of just the, the the impact of the pandemic on students and learning. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that. Um, you know, uh, learning loss is very profound mm -hmm. and the issue with the pandemic is it sort of created this sort of crisis within a crisis. So I think even before the pandemic um, sort of came to us, um, we, we knew that we had quite serious sort of learning gaps, mm -hmm. um, both, you know, within Indonesia but also globally. I mean, you know, I think a, a lot of countries were really grappling with trying to ensure that children could actually learn the fundamentals, which mm -hmm. are, you know, literacy and numeracy, mm -hmm. um, whether that be in, you know, the early years all the way up to, you know, secondary education. Mm -hmm. It was something of concern to, I think, a great many countries around the world. And what the pandemic has done is that it's kind of exacerbated a problem that already existed. Um, and so, I mean, you know, this is, is something that now we are obviously all trying to focus on and work together to address. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the figures I have kind of in front of me is that into, if we kind of think about the sort of economic <laughs> impact of these mm -hmm. things, um, a recent study conducted by UNICEF, UNESCO and the World Bank has estimated that there's about $17 trillion in lifetime earnings that's based on present values that has, have been lost as a result of the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic related school closures. So if you think of just the magnitude of that figure, the impact that that has... 17 trillion. 17 trillion, you know, um, this is not insignificant. Right. So now I think uh, countries are now, you know, having to grapple with that. You know, how do we actually pick up and move on from this very significant impact that, that young people um, will have now and, and possibly into the future if we don't act very decisively? Um, so currently it's already $17 trillion lost the impact of the pandemic, like the yeah. value for the yes. So if you yeah. keep going, not intervention, that's exactly. going to be worse. It will, it will. So I think these are these are things that you know are, are very concerning, and you know also I think when we reflect on uh, generally, I mean I think your audience also will there'll pro probably be a lot of parents joining us you know today. Mm -hmm. um, UNICEF uh, did some uh, you know survey work um, late last year and. We found that of the parents that we interviewed, around three in four parents were really concerned about learning um, loss um, due to the, you know, obviously disruptions that, you know, schools weren't open, children weren't able to go back to school. So there's a great deal of community concern um, about the impact of learning loss, uh, not only now, but what it means for, you know, the, the future of, of children. Um, and I mean, that's, I think, also to reflect that, you know, households, um, themselves have been very affected by the pandemic in a socio and economic sense. Right. And so if we can't 
have children return to education and catch up on learning, then the impact on households will be even even greater. You know, one, one can very logically assume right. that that, that may, may occur. And I think the other thing to think about also is um, the impact that the pandemic has had, particularly on um, rural and poor households. Mm. So in some ways, the pandemic has really highlighted the inequities in learning um, globally and also I think you know and you're, you're the expert on Indonesia but certainly you know I think we understand that there are uh, you know inequities in Indonesia in terms of learning that we are trying to tackle but unfortunately the pandemic has made that more difficult um, children you know as many people know children were not many children in really rural and remote areas would not have access to internet they were not able to you know engage in remote learning um, and so this really made made it a much worse situation for them. So that you know they they have a lot to catch up on. You know if we can um, get them back to school. Um, and then I think the other thing that sort of compounded the issue of children in really remote and perhaps disadvantaged communities was that parents themselves didn't necessarily feel that they either had the time because of the fact that they had to, you know, go out and earn a living for right. their family um, or, or perhaps because they, they felt that they didn't necessarily have the right skills to support their children right. to learn yeah. remotely as well. Yeah. And so that's also been, I'm sure, an added pressure, you know, on families and, and, and children. Um, and I think I'd like to pick up on the point that uh, Mr Han um, has made also. This point about well-being um, and the, the sort of impact that that has had on children in terms of this sort of isolation, the social distancing, um, we have to reflect that schools are not only learning institutions. They're, they're institutions that you know are actually about supporting um, children to grow socially, um, you know, uh, mentally, and you know all of those good things. So you know, I, I do think that um, you know we can't we can't neglect that either. Either you know. It, it is very significant, the learning loss, but it's also the impact, the, socio, um, the, the sort of uh, psychosocial impact that has had as well on children that we need to really think through carefully about how we can support them to, to move ahead on things. So, yeah, so it's a big yeah, job ahead, uh, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, the figure and the, the, the description from Ms. Catherine is just like uh, very clear how the impact is very serious. Uh, but also that also prompts us to actually to let's start you know moving let's let's do something about it uh, now yes. protecting the most vulnerable groups right i think both mr han and miss catherine mentioned about this uh, mr han uh, let me go back to you um, how does australia uh, look after the vulnerable groups because we know mm. they are the ones who are most affected uh, yes. the the impact of learning loss is not equal Ms. Catherine mentioned about uh, it's exacerbated the inequity in, in education, especially in the uh, rural, uh, remote areas, and maybe other kind of uh, social uh, attributes, socioeconomic status, geographic location, and mm. etc. Gender. So, what is the uh, Australia strategy to uh, to look after the vulnerable groups uh, in your education system? The, the thing about disadvantaged groups is that there are no borders. Mm. This is a issue across all countries, right. Australia included, and, and some of those um, you know, more advanced, perhaps you know, developed countries as well. It, that's an issue that's present. Mm. So the government certainly recognise that. You know, mm. The impact on this group is often greater. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so for Australia's perspective, uh, the key groups that we identify as vulnerable, especially in regards to, to learning loss during this environment, mm. are Indigenous Australians, mm -hmm. those Australians in regional and remote areas, mm -hmm. and individuals with disability. Mm. So at a broad level, for um, vulnerable and disadvantaged uh, people and young, young children, what we do is that we do provide additional resources to help them. Mm. And a lot of that to do is to do with access to assets such as IT, laptops and internet. Those are very basic things through the pandemic uh, a lot of these uh, uh, individuals might not have access to. So we provided additional funding and resources around uh, that component. We also provided them with the option 
around face-to-face -face and online learning, mm -hmm. which is perhaps not available for those individuals in metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. You know, because when we're talking about these disadvantaged groups, we are largely talking about, you know, those individuals that live outside of Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, mm -hmm. those big cities. Mm -hmm. So we gave them the option because we do realise, you know, the impact of learning loss will be largely greater for these group of individuals. Mm -hmm. So perhaps I'll go into a bit more detail around these individual groups. Mm -hmm. So for Indigenous Australians, there's always been a very strong focus uh, for the Australian government to try to close that education gap mm -hmm. between the non-Indigenous Australians and mm -hmm. Indigenous Australians. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a few things we're, we're doing. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're doing is providing the capital mm -hmm. to build infrastructure for those regional remote communities. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can I just say, there's Indigenous Australians and those remote remote communities, there's a lot of um, overlap between, mm -hmm. between the two. Many of these remote communities have higher proportion of Indigenous Australians. Mm -hmm. So building that infrastructure, building those capital is a very important uh, part of the piece. Mm -hmm. We also have a very strong focus uh, around the literacy component. Mm -hmm. So we provide additional resources around uh, scaling up those reading programs. Another thing we do is we're trying to create stronger partnerships between metropolitan schools and those regional schools oh. because oftentimes when, when they're so isolated and they're so segregated, they don't see you know, the teaching practices and perhaps mm. be able to attract the higher quality teachers uh, into those areas. And of course, that has a downstream effect on students. When we talk about people with disability, mm -hmm. that's uh, another group that Australian government takes very seriously. Mm -hmm. So we do have, uh, we implemented the disability standards for education uh, piece of regulation and legislation. And that essentially puts the obligation on schools to ensure that they make reasonable adjustments mm -hmm. to enable students with disability to have access and participate in schooling and education as their peers. There was a recent review of uh, these standards in 2020, and the review sort of recommended stronger support for both teachers, mm -hmm. um, school leaders, parents, and students to uh, make sure they're informed of, of their rights and their obligations under this act. Mm -hmm. And additionally, our Prime Minister announced in early 2022 that there was going to be a review into the impact of COVID-19 on students with disability. Mm -hmm. So there is going to be a, a targeted focus on these vulnerable groups because we think mm -hmm. that's where the effort should go to in terms of addressing that, that learning loss. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mr. Han. Um, and thank you so much also for breaking down the, the, the vulnerable groups in Australia and mm. different strategies on how to tackle the issue there. Um, I, I, again, like you also emphasize on literacy and Kath, Ms. Catherine was saying about literacy and numeracy, very important that we need to protect that uh, for mm -hmm. our future uh, uh, generation, uh, for them to, uh, to be lifelong learners. And mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have that skills, how can they uh, survive uh, for the future? Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, I like the idea that the, and it reminds me of what we're doing in Indonesia, the connecting schools. Mm. Uh, the the schools in the in the urban areas and yes. the and rural areas, uh, and this reminds us uh, of me especially for our program the sekolah penggerak or guru penggerak, mm. where the idea is that uh, the schools who are good they they will have to uh, they have the calling to also help the other schools, mm. and the the, the the teachers are the same philosophy. This is actually the gotong royong philosophy, mm. that uh, if you can actually uh, survive and actually can do well and then don't just stop there you need to look around and help others mm -hmm. also to uh, to connect and also to improve others so then we can uh, move together and uh, reach the, the the good standard together mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting um, and also for disabilities the adjustment that is needed and also I think the capacity for the teachers to make that adjustment mm -hmm. Miss um, Catherine I think before our break I have this question, we, we know Australian situation is uh, maybe quite unique, right? But how about, uh, I think, uh, this uh, big 
message calling, let's go back to school for uh, uh, globally. Uh, mm. uh, Stefania Giannini, the assistant director, the deputy for education in UNESCO mentioned about this. I think also the head of UNICEF mentioned about this. Mm. Why face-to-face -face learning still like the most effective <laughs> for us to yes. catch up? <laughs> yes, thank you so much for the question, Pat Yuan, um, because actually it's, it is the most critical okay. thing. And, and I do want to maybe just start by saying it is absolutely important that everyone goes back to school okay. you know, in, in Indonesia and the world. Okay. Um, we know that, I mean, as, as effective as, you know, we know that the, the digital learning that took place, um, you know, over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. I mean, it has been, it's been, been very important for a lot of children mm -hmm. you know it's kept them learning mm -hmm. I think um, digital education actually you know has the potential in the ro long run to be a very significant equalizer mm -hmm. when it comes to actually children accessing mm -hmm. education and really flourishing in learning mm -hmm. but the reality is that we still know that children learn most effectively when they're sitting in a classroom they're interacting with their teachers and their and their class peers it is really, it, you know, there is no substitute for that. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, this is why, you know, really we, we, it is most important to really keep schools open, to get now that Indonesia has their, the new school year starting mm -hmm. soon, That's to right. really get everyone back. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, schools are not just learning institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, this is also about, you know, children growing socially, emotionally, you know, um, so we, we, and that also helps, I'm sure, with learning as well, you know, like it's all part of the, 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 the whole thing, it's all connected. So, um, you know, I, I do feel that, um, you know, this is most, most critical. Mm. Um, and I think the, the evidence really shows that the longer a child remains out of school, the less likely they are to return as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, given that we've had a lot of millions and millions of children, you know, around the world and in, and in Indonesia um, who have, you know, have been out of school because schools have been closed and then schools kind of reopened and then it's kind of closed mm. again. I mean, it's been very disrupted because right. of the nature mm. of the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, this is the time now. I think, you know, as you mentioned, we're not out of the pandemic yet, mm -hmm. but we have enough you know, safeguards. Um, with, we understand more about the, the, the virus. We have our vaccinations Vaccination. in place. You know, and that, that's the other thing to mention is that, you know, I think, um, you know, Indonesia has done an amazing job of, of really prioritising vaccination for teachers, teachers so that there could be a safe space mm -hmm. um, for, for children to go back to school. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, these are, these are all really um, important pillars in um, getting children back in, into the classroom. And Yes, I really um, just can't really say or emphasise enough how important face-to-face -face learning is. Um, and, you know, one thing I will say is that particularly for children in the, uh, either involved in early childhood education or the early grades of primary, um, what was really difficult for them during the pandemic is that um, they were least likely to really benefit from digital learning mm. because we know that children of a very young age really need that face-to-face -face stimulation in the classroom so in fact that's even more reason to get children back to school because mm. particularly the young ones probably have a great deal to catch up on perhaps even more than the older students who are able to in some way benefit from remote learning the younger children much more difficult situation mm -hmm. so that's even more reason to to you know really prioritize face-to-face -face learning at this time and i'm really excited to to know that you know that that indonesia is really striving very strongly mm -hmm. to promote 100 percent face-to-face learning and that this is going to be enacted as part of the the new school year so yeah. thank you so much miss yeah. catherine um Now, sahabat Dikbud, menarik sekali ya uh, perbincangan kita. Uh, kita ini pasti nanti akan berlanjut, uh, tapi buat sekarang uh, kita nonton dulu video berikut ini. Jangan kemana-mana ya. Aku senang sekali bisa kembali ke sekolah. Sudah tidak sabar bertemu dengan bapak dan ibu guru. Dan bertemu dengan teman-temanku. Gambi. Aku khawatir. Kadang-kadang saya merasa sulit. Untuk mengikuti pelajaran Selama sekolah tutup karena COVID Tahun ajaran baru seharusnya merupakan tahun yang menyenangkan untuk anak-anak 
Tapi setelah lebih dari dua tahun pembelajaran jarak jauh, sebagian anak mengalami ketertinggalan dan juga mungkin merasa cemas. Tapi saya yakin Anda bisa membantu. Mari beri dukungan. Tanya anak Anda, apakah ia kesulitan di mata pelajaran tertentu? Beri bantuan dan juga bicarakan dengan bapak dan ibu guru untuk mengejar ketertinggalan mereka. Tetap hati-hati, pastikan mereka mengikuti seluruh protokol kesehatan yang berlaku. Pastikan anak Anda aman dan mendapatkan dukungan untuk belajar secara optimal. Kembali ke sekolah dengan aman dan gembira. Halo sahabat Dikbud, semua kembali lagi. Bagaimana tadi video barusan? Sangat menarik kan ya? Uh, nah, sekarang kita lanjutkan diskusi kita dengan uh, tamu kita yang luar biasa. So, now let us go deeper uh, with our uh, discussion this afternoon uh, under the theme of the importance of face-to-face -face learning in G20 countries. Mr. Han, let me uh, go to you again. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, Australia and the importance of uh, 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 helping teachers uh, with their capacity to deal with the situation. Yes. So, how does Australia prepare the teachers to be ready for conducting uh, the face-to-face -face learning, uh, especially uh, in the recovery of the pandemic? Thanks for the question, Paki Wan. Um, we know how important teachers play mm -hmm. in, in terms of their role in, in making a difference in a student's uh, learning journey and learning outcome. So that is a strong focus for us. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a couple of things over here. One is about providing the right support and resources. Mm -hmm. The other one is about creating the supply of adequate and high quality teachers to be into the system. Mm. So if we were to go to the resources, so AITSUL, the Australian Institute mm. of uh, teachers, teachers and School, School Leadership, Leader. Uh, they introduced a whole range of resources uh, at the start of the pandemic to help teachers and school leaders to sort of, uh, I guess, uh, manage and understand the best practice that's out there about the, you know, the different elements of, uh, I guess, teaching under different circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and those resources come from state territories, from think tanks, you know, research organisations, as, as well as expertise in teaching. And they covered a whole bunch of different components, which included segments on getting back to school, mm -hmm. remote learning, mm -hmm. further understanding and deepening the understanding of students' needs. Mm -hmm. So in relation to uh, going back to school, a lot of the resources, again, was quite focused on the health mm -hmm. protocols. Mm -hmm. It's about how to introduce the health and sanitation protocols in a different setting, but it's also about recognizing the, the emotional and social impacts of the isolation periods um, for kids and for teachers that are being outside of the classroom for a long period of time. So it is really about supporting their well-being, supporting their mental state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think all of this is actually underpinned by quite a strong initial teacher education framework mm -hmm. in Australia. So I think teachers were relatively well prepared and flexible enough to adapt to a new environment. Mm. And I think that is driven by a, a very strong system in terms of how they're prepared to go into the classroom. So I can probably break that into three components. The first is about that uh, professional knowledge, then it's about the pre professional practice, mm -hmm. and the last part is about professional learning. So with professional knowledge, it is all about understanding and learning about what students want. What do they want? How do they learn? What is the content and what is the curriculum and how that is to be delivered? Once you understand that, you're of course going to the practice component. So it is about implementing those policies. How do we create an inclusive classroom? You know, how do we make the, get the best out of students and how do we assess and report on student outcomes? The last part about professional learning uh, and training is probably the most critical piece in, in relation to transitioning uh, back face to face. Mm. So I think teachers are, are, are creatures that, um, that likes to continue to learn mm -hmm. and they like to engage and network. So what we saw anecdotally was a lot of you know, cross teacher sector engagement with each other about what are the best practices around health and sanitation. But stuff around the reconfiguration of schools and classrooms, because that's different mm. when you come back, but also being flexible enough to sort of, um, uh, you know, to, to work in a, in a hybrid environment where mm. you might be, um, you know, teaching some mm. components of your course face-to-face, -face, 
while others are still remotely, even though we are transitioning back. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say our T RTE framework is perfect. You know, I, I think Australia is a country that consistently and constantly looks out our, our system and look at ways to improve it. Mm -hmm. So there was actually quite a recent and significant review of RT framework that finalised mm -hmm. in February 2022. Mm -hmm. And that sort of goes into a few key points. It was about how do we attract the youngest and brightest individuals mm -hmm. into the teaching profession. It was about um, identifying the best practice in terms of preparing teachers for the classroom. So there was a recommendation to establish a RTE centre of excellence mm -hmm. that focuses on research about the pra best practice for teacher preparation. Mm -hmm. It was about trying to create a, a sustainable pipeline of teachers and supporting them in the early years of teaching. Mm -hmm. Because what we don't want is people to go through four or five years of university training, be in the system for three years mm -hmm. and leave. Turn over, yeah. We want to make sure we can retain these people in the workforce. Nice. And I think what the Australian government is doing is really focusing on that supply side of things. Mm -hmm. It's really about making sure we're getting those people into the right areas, into the right subjects. And so there's a few initiatives. We are providing subsidies for bright school leavers to get into the system. Mm. We're providing um, incentive, financial incentives for teachers to be placed in regional remote places. Mm. So there are little things we're doing uh, to try to create that sustainable supply of teachers. So it's about the quality and the supply. Mm -hmm. Wow, very comprehensive. Thank you so much, Mr. Han. I think um, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, the first one is the providing the resources, and then uh, and then looking at the the inputs uh, because this is uh, I, I can imagine like uh, teachers or teacher candidates who are in, in the initial teacher education now must be you know disrupted too you know like thinking about their classroom now can be different than maybe before mm -hmm. the pandemic and i think that's how it's supposed to be mm -hmm. um and it's also interesting that the the resources that are uh, that either from aidsel uh, and also i think when teachers uh, uh learn and share with each other through their engagement with uh, their, mm -hmm. their network the focus is on health protocols again this is like a uh, very, uh, I'd like to underline this because um, sometimes we forget that maybe uh, uh, the children are back to school and the first thing that maybe is in some teacher's mind is just, oh, let's go to model one, two, and three in this week. We need to catch up instead of looking at their uh, social, emotional, well-being situation. Mm. And, yes. and I think uh, the strategy in Australia is to, to prepare teachers to address this because it is something that maybe not seen but it is felt very strongly like the, the feeling of isolation, mm. the uncertainty, the disruption mm. affecting their well-being and therefore the teaching and learning strategy instead of going straight to how to teach math or science and etc. It's more about how we can support students well-being when they uh, go back to mm. school and you also mentioned that we are still in transition. Mm. Some maybe are still back to school. Some maybe are still doing hybrid oh, or remote yeah. learning. Mm. Mm. Now, Miss Catherine, what about? We're looking at the global context now. Yes, <laughs> How can indeed. we help teachers prepare teachers to face uh, face to face learning? Uh, yes. Well, situation? thank you so much for the question, Part Yuan. Um, firstly, I would like to really pay my respects to teachers before I even answer this question because I think that you know teachers have they're at the front line Let, let's let's acknowledge that and they have been for the last you know more than two years during the pandemic and have done the most amazing job of keeping things going and so I just want to acknowledge teachers for all of their hard work and give them my immense respect because I'm not a teacher um, but I do absolutely respect you know, the, the profession of teaching. And we have to do everything we can to really support teachers to get back into the classroom to mm -hmm. be supporting their, mm -hmm. their students. So firstly, I mean, from a, I guess, global, but also thinking through maybe a little bit about the Indonesia context, um, I do think that, you know, many countries have actually really prioritised, firstly, the health aspects of things. So 
uh, you know, teachers have been prioritised for vaccination, for example. And that's something that, in fact, many countries in Southeast Asia have really committed to and have done a very good job, including Indonesia. I know that was a point that I, I made before, but I do think it's important to, you know, really emphasise this, that the amount of work that has gone into sort of giving teachers that sort of um, safety and health, mm -hmm. you know, coverage is, is very important. And you can't really, you know, it's a very important pillar in even sort of speaking about, um, you know, supporting teachers to get back into the classroom. Because if we didn't have that, it would That's be very right. difficult to be having right. any further conversations, yeah. you know, on this. Um, I think the other, uh, to, to sort of, you know, think through what we can actually do uh, to support teachers is, you know, we know that um, catch-up learning or remedial education can't really take place until children are back in school. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that teachers have all the tools that at their disposal to really be able to apply remedial or catch-up learning. You know, it's very, very critical. Um, and, you know, like I said before, really focusing on the fundamentals to make sure that teachers have the right tools to help their students, you know, catch up on, on literacy and numeracy. I should also mention that 21st century skills development is also mm -hmm. really important, mm -hmm. particularly for, for children in sort of, you know, uh, more senior grades. Mm -hmm. um, this is really critical as well. So I think we, we absolutely have to give teachers, um, you know, solid, uh, you know, tools to help them actually apply remedial or catch up, catch up learning pedagogical methods in their classroom. I mean, absolutely number one. Um, and then how we do that is we need to really make sure that teachers have adequate assessment tools mm. that they can use to actually um, assess, you know, the, the, the relative um, learning levels of all of, all of their students mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a sort of almost like an individual basis, in fact. In a perfect world, that's, that's mm. exactly what would happen. And so using, um, whether it's uh, learning assessment tools that are developed by, you know, national governments, mm -hmm. whether it's adapting global assessment mm -hmm. tools, so we have things like the early grade learning assessment, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, you know, there's lots of different kinds of assessments. But, um, you know, we need to make sure that they're simple, that they're easy to use, and that teachers feel sort of a degree of confidence in applying these kinds of um, tools. Then I think the other thing to mention is that a lot of teachers, even though before the pandemic, probably in a lot of countries, um, teachers were starting to, you know, embrace technology and, mm -hmm. and use that as part of their pedagogical approach in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Actually, what, what COVID has taught us all is that, you know, we need to really ramp up and, and expedite our mm -hmm. skills, <laughs> everyone in those, right. <laughs> in digital learning. So um, I think the other thing is to really try and make sure that teachers are supported to really have the basics um, in being able to apply the basics of digital cool. learning as well so that they could, you know, actually apply almost like a hybrid approach so that right. maybe we have most of the time children are face-to-face -face learning and the teachers are supporting them, but then it's always good to have some element of ICT and, and sort of more of that digital interface as well. But obviously every teacher in every school will be facing a different context. Mm -hmm. They will have different levels of resources mm -hmm. that they can use. Mm -hmm. um, teachers in very remote areas would have a very different set of resources mm -hmm. from teachers in big cities, you know, around the world. Mm -hmm. So we have to be also realistic with our expectations that we place on teachers mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think we just need to support teachers and thank them very, very much and encourage them to move ahead, you know, in a really, really positive way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Catherine. This is um, <coughs> very comprehensive from supporting teachers with the, the health uh, support in terms of the vaccination, prioritizing teachers and education personnel. Uh, and also helping them with the, the pedagogy. Uh, but it's not just about the, the pedagogy, but also the assessment. I think Ms. Catherine underlined this, that we need to uh, see how the students are with uh, assessment tools that are simple, uh, easy to use, and also uh, teachers are confident uh, in, in using uh, those assessment tools. Um, and also from the assessment uh, results, uh, teachers can uh, cre uh, structure the lessons, the remedial learning, and Ms. Catherine again uh, mentioning how it is very important to focus on the foundational uh, competencies 
such as literacy and numeracy, but she also added the 21st century uh, skills. I think we can uh, we know this uh, quite famously as the four C's: the critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. communication. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have the profil pelajar Pancasila, which is actually the uh, a little bit the Indonesian version of the 21st century skills in which we have the first is about the good spirituality this is very much uh, Indonesian uh, characteristic uh, the second one is uh, Mandiri is like independence uh, and the third one is of course critical thinking creativity and then we have uh, Gotong Royong Gotong Royong is quite unique it's not just about collaboration and also the communication is also there but there is a sense of the empathy and mm. uh, social responsibility. Mm. So yeah. when you, that prompt you to collaborate. So you're not thinking about what is only benefit for you, but it's actually as a community, what should we do? So that is the uh, Gotong Royong, but actually it's collaboration and communication. And the other one is global citizenship, or we call that Kebinekaan Global, because we believe diversity is a strength and uh, we are uh, we ha we have a motto bineka tunggal ika right U uh, unity in diversity mm -hmm. so we believe uh, uh, diversity is just the, uh, the the capital for all of us to build a better uh, civilization and humanity mm -hmm. um, and mr han so is there a possible collaboration between uh, indonesia and australia in this context to support the reinstatement of the face-to-face -face, uh, learning? Uh, maybe you have some ideas? Yeah, I'd like to say Australia would always be very happy to collaborate with Indonesia and on, on education-related matters. Mm -hmm. And I think we are doing a few things uh, from a current perspective, mm -hmm. and, and we will uh, move into the future as well. So, you know, from a multilateral forum perspective, Australia is involved with the uh, UNESCO Transforming Education Summit, right. which happened in Paris last week towards the uh, end of June. Yeah. And that is largely around the United Nations Sustainability mm -hmm. Development Goals mm -hmm. and goal number four, which is around that quality okay. education. So Australia is very supporters, uh, very strong support um, of you know, that sustainable approach and making sure and encouraging countries think about that education continuity. Um, and, and we know, you know, the UN Secretary General is very much focused on that, you know, 2030 agenda around mm -hmm. sustainable development. And so we are fully on board with, with that approach and we'll continue to engage through, through those type of forums mm -hmm. um, from a multilateral perspective. Mm -hmm. In terms of the bilateral relationship, so understand um, your department, your ministry mm -hmm. and my department of education is looking to agree on a MOU. Mm -hmm. This is around, this is an overarching MOU mm -hmm. that talks about the collaboration and cooperation on education matters, mm -hmm. right from basic education to schooling, mm -hmm. to higher education, to research, to skills. Mm -hmm. uh, once we try to have this um, MOU agreed and signed, I think that'll just further strengthen mm -hmm. and build on what we have here. But we also have some uh, programs, development programs, mm -hmm. Australia has with Indonesia, and you might be familiar with the Inno Innovasi program, yeah. and I'm sure Catherine is fantastic. very, uh, very much <laughs> intimate with with that program too. I visited and, some of the Innovasi schools in Nusa Tenggara Barat. They are really great. Yeah, and, and that's all the feedback that we hear. Like it's such a a positive program that's actually making a difference in regional, remote parts of of Indonesia. You know, the Innovasi program is about improving the basic literacy, numeracy, numeracy yeah. and critical thinking skills yeah. of the primary school kids here. And I know Innovasi has been working with your ministry around, you know, uh, the transition, first of all, to remote learning and then trying to address that learning loss. Mm -hmm. And then now the transition back into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the examples of the work that's been happening in that space is I know they funded a report mm -hmm. that looked into where are the learning loss occurring? Mm -hmm. So identifying that will certainly help your ministry and your government to figure out where the best effort should go to in terms of addressing those uh, learning loss. Mm -hmm. Understand uh, Innovasi is also working with, I think, 19 different uh, provinces right. across um, districts, sorry, yeah. across East Java, 
East Kalimantan, Kalimantan. East and West uh, Nusa Tenggara, uh, around how to reopen those schools and providing um, teaching approaches to address learning loss. I think the data suggests that in terms of benefit, it, it has impacted on over close to 4,000 teachers, mm -hmm. 40,000 students. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant project. And understand uh, Innovasi is also working with UNICEF uh, around reopening schools, safely reopening schools in Papua and West Papua as well. So I think those are little snippets of the collaboration that is currently happening between the two countries. But that's not to say we shouldn't do more. And I think, you know, through the G20 program and through our, you know, continuous diplomatic relationship here, we will continue to build on our collaboration mm -hmm. and, you know, facilitate learning, two-way learning, mutually beneficial learning. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd be very excited to, you know, perhaps have yourself, Park Ewan, to come, come to Australia to visit perhaps our faculties of education mm -hmm. in terms of how they deliver initial teacher education, mm -hmm. you know, to our bright students mm -hmm. who will become future leaders and future teachers mm -hmm. um, of the system back home. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Han. I, I just, uh, I mean, I've been engaged with uh, uh, quite a few of what you just mentioned. And in particular, I'd like to mention about Innovasi. What is impressive about their approach is uh, the, it's empowering the stakeholders, local stakeholders, to have the ownership for change. Mm. I think uh, it's, it's a very uh, uh, inspiring, and I think uh, for us also to think about how, because we have like 514 local governments, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which is a lot. It's a lot yeah. If we visit one uh, local government a day, one year is not enough because we only have 365. <laughs> yeah. That is the uh, unique of our uh, education governance, but it is what it is. But mm. they have the autonomy. Right, the, the autonomy and also the budget mm. for governing, uh, managing their education ecosystem. Um, so we need to help them, but then in a way that empowering. And so maybe just like teachers, so they have like the confidence to mm. actually do or uh, create programs to support student learning and especially for the learning loss. So mm. looking forward for further collaboration, Mr. Han, with Australia. And uh, now, Ms. Catherine. What about UNICEF, mm. the program that UNICEF perhaps uh, are doing at the moment to yeah. help to put kids back to school, yes. <laughs> especially well, the face-to-face -face learning? Thank you very much for the, for the question, Pat Yuan. Um, maybe I, I'd like to reflect a little bit globally mm. on, on some of the sort of, I guess, thinking that UNICEF is, is really promoting um, in terms of um, try, that whole discussion around trying to get children back to school. Um, so UNICEF, uh, in collaboration with UNESCO and the World Bank, recently devised um, a framework called the RAPID Framework. Mm. Um, and this, this framework is really encouraging countries around the world to focus on you know, a few key things. Um, the first is we, we must try to reach and retain every child in school. We have to absolutely try to do that. We've got to assess their learning levels. Mm. You know, we've got to take that time to really understand where children are at with their own learning you know, pathway. Um, we also need to prioritise the fundamentals, which I've, we've sort of mentioned quite a bit. Um, the literacy and numeracy pieces are really, really important um, you know, pieces of this puzzle. Um, we also have to help uh, students really um, catch up on learning and not only just catch up but also progress beyond mm. the learning that they've lost. So this, this is another really important area. And finally, as part of this rapid framework, we're also saying that we really need to develop the, the, the sort of psychosocial health and well-being of every, you know, every child going back to school. So these are, these are really key priorities. Um, I think the other thing perhaps you know, to mention um, is that you know, UNICEF also is sort of um, really focusing on trying to promote, you know, this is sort of really globally, um, that we need to make sure that children are ready to start primary school. Now, um, UNICEF is sort of saying, you know, at age five, um, children really need to be ready. So that, that actually implies that they need to have had some, uh, you know, early childhood 
mm. um, education and development opportunity. Mm. Um, now, in Indonesia, it may be a different context, and you know far better than me on that. Um, it might be a slightly higher age mm. that we might be looking at. But it's really, really important to promote early childhood um, learning and development because children will, f will fundamentally will not be ready to transition to primary school if we don't do that. And a lot of evidence is out there, um, you know, both you know, globally, um, you know, I'm sure at country level as well, that investment in early childhood education is one of the most impactful investments both from a sort of social learning perspective, but also from an economic perspective that any country can make, you know, in education. It has such a profound, you know, uh, impact. I think the other thing that we're sort of saying is that um, children age 10, they must have already acquired, you know, the basic literacy and numeracy skills. Mm -hmm. um, and this really means that we have to focus on improving the quality of education. The only way they're going to be able to, to really get there is by having really good quality instruction you know, in the classroom. Mm. So it's very important. And then the other pillar to this is that age, by age 18, um, children and adolescents, you know, children, well, adolescents, I guess, <laughs> by then, um, are ready to, you know, for life, and their work life, you know, mm -hmm. to start their, their, their life in, um, you know, potentially in careers and, and career pathways. And we really need to focus, as we've said before, on 21st century skills and the definition that you gave um, of, unit, of Indonesia's you know, approach to that sounds incredibly you know, comprehensive and, and fantastic. So this also includes you know, supporting young people to really you know, understand ICT, but also so that that can really benefit their learning and, and their career pathways. Mm -hmm. Although I, I have to say there must be millions of adolescents in Indonesia that are incredible experts in all this already, but um, thinking particularly of students in rural and remote areas that may not have the same opportunities as, as students in, you know, urban areas. Um, so, yeah, and so, like, in, that's sort of from a global perspective, and if I now think through um, a little bit on what we're doing um, in Indonesia, I mean, firstly, we're very proud to be working with the Ministry of Education on a number of front so thank you and your team and there are other wonderful colleagues that we're working with at the ministry um, you know in partnership we are also obviously understanding that Indonesia is a very decentralized you know environment that we work in we're very proud to be working with um, lots of districts and provinces um, for our program we have a very strong focus on eastern Indonesia mm -hmm. because um, I think if you look at really the education data some of the largest learning gaps are actually within the, you know, a lot of um, the areas within the east. Yeah. Um, and so we have a very strong focus in that area. Um, we are working uh, particularly to try and support out of school children um, to return to learning. And we're really doing that through these really incredible partnerships with um, provincial and district governments. And that can be firstly um, investing in really nationwide monitoring of trying to understand the situation of out-of-school children and how they've been impacted mm. by, the, by the pandemic. Um, so helping district governments to sort of really understand what the particular situation is of out-of-school children in their geographic areas. But then going further and then working with district governments to help them create sort of action-oriented planning and budgeting and, and actions, you know, like really tangible actions to, to help out of school children return to learning. And that can be done in, in, in a number of ways. It could be um, things like sort of scholarships, it could be um, some sort of uh, support, you know, to, to families, um, whether it be, you know, provision of ICT devices or other kinds of, kinds of support. But, you know, this is really important, important sort of um, area because, you know, out of school children are often, you know, the children that sort of are kind of invisible. So we don't kind of necessarily pick them up within mm the system and so trying to really understand the situation of out of school children is very important. And, and the other thing um, that you know was mentioned um, by Mr Hahn is that UNICEF is working a lot in, in Papua um, and we're very very proud of that work. Um, in fact Australia is a very important partner in that work um, and of course um, all of our uh, you know ministry colleagues but also our subnational colleagues. So our work there is very much focused on early grade um, learning, including literacy and numeracy. And it, it really does um, respond very directly to the issues around the pandemic. I mean, both I should say the out of school children, 
you know, issue is directly related to the pandemic, given the fact that we know that more and more children, you know, have had to decide to perhaps leave school because of the socio-economic impact of their families. But also um, children in, um, you know, areas like Papua, in the early grades, you know, they have also sustained very significant learning loss. So even though our program in early grade learning um, pre-existed the pandemic, mm. in fact, it's even more needed in this context. You know, it's really, really important. So we're working a lot with teachers and districts. And I think the other thing to mention, and you very kindly mentioned and reminded, reminded us all of the, just the scale that, of Indonesia, you know, and all these, you know, <laughs> district governments and, and everything. We're adding more three new local governments <laughs> <laughs> three more districts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so, so, you know, then we have to think how can we work effectively, you know, at scale. <coughs> One of the things that UNICEF is really focusing on in our education work is to really um, try to work with districts to give them that sort of technical support to understand the mm. pressing education issues that they are grappling with because of the pandemic but also uh, working with them to try and uh, prioritise their own budget and resources to really um, plan and action, um, you know, programs that can really bring children back to the, back to the classroom and help them with, with learning as well. And that's a very important pillar of what we're doing um, because, you know, um, even though UNICEF is a global organisation, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in Indonesia. So if we don't carefully... Um, cultivate good relations with um, our colleagues at um, sub-national level and, and really help them to use their resources more wisely, then, you know, it, it will, it's a missed opportunity and I think we can, we can actually spread, have a, a great deal more impact if we work in that way. Um, so, and then I think lastly, I'd just like to mention that we're also very proudly working with the Ministry of Education on supporting 21st century learning. Mm. And, you know, we know that the Ministry has invested a great deal of time and effort in creating fantastic learning platforms, mm -hmm. whether that be for teachers, whether it be for students, whether it be for parents, you know, it's really been most impressive, um, the, the, the work that has happened over the last couple of years um, due to the pandemic. And so UNICEF has been very proud to be working with the ministry on different aspects. So with a, with a strong focus on 21st century skills, also on life skills. Mm -hmm. So these are very important things that, you know, young people need mm -hmm. um, to make their way in the world. So, um, you know, we are very happy to be working in that area. And I think, again, a very important investment in terms of pandemic recovery um, and, you know, future prospects for, for children in Indonesia. So thank you very much for the wow. question. Wow, thank you so much, Ms. Kathleen. From the global perspective and then going to Indonesia, and then we go to the eastern part and then Papua. So you're <laughs> going like from like big Indeed. scale and then going a bit big, uh, smaller and then going more uh, focused and then uh, focusing on sub-national government. <laughs> so it's amazing. So Sahabat Dikbud, we just listened to uh, like very interesting insights from our uh, guests uh, in tackling the, uh, uh, the situation during the pandemic and also how to support face-to-face uh, -face learning uh, in the face of the transition or recovery. Uh, ini saya akan menggunakan bahasa Indonesia uh, buat sahabat di boot yang sudah punya pertanyaan. Uh, Mudah-mudahan sudah mulai ngetik ya pertanyaannya di chat box. Uh, tapi sebelum kita masuk ke sesi tanya jawab, uh, kita nonton video dulu ya. Silakan. Aku senang sekali bisa kembali ke sekolah. Sudah tidak sabar bertemu dengan bapak dan ibu guru. Dan bertemu dengan teman-temanku. Gambe. Aku khawatir. Kadang-kadang saya merasa sulit untuk mengikuti pelajaran. Selama sekolah tutup karena COVID. Tahun ajaran baru seharusnya merupakan tahun yang menyenangkan untuk anak-anak. Tapi setelah lebih dari dua tahun pembelajaran jarak jauh, sebagian anak mengalami ketertinggalan dan juga mungkin merasa cemas. Tapi saya yakin Anda bisa membantu. Mari beri dukungan. Tanya anak Anda, apakah ia kesulitan di mata pelajaran tertentu? Beri bantuan dan juga bicarakan dengan bapak dan ibu guru untuk mengejar ketertinggalan mereka. Tetap hati-hati, pastikan mereka mengikuti seluruh protokol kesehatan yang berlaku. Pastikan anak Anda aman dan mendapatkan dukungan untuk belajar secara optimal. Kembali ke sekolah dengan aman dan gembira.
Halo sahabat Dikbud, kembali lagi di Selaturahmi Merdeka Belajar pada sore hari ini. Saat ini kita memasuki sesi tanya-jawab dan kita sudah uh, ada beberapa pertanyaan uh, dari partisipan webinar. Uh, kita bacakan dulu ya, ini pertanyaannya dalam bahasa Inggris dari uh, Felix Putra. Pak Felix Putra menanyakan kepada Mr. Han. So Mr. Han, uh, this is the question for you. How does the Australian government support schools with their health and sanitation facilities? Thanks, uh, Park Ewan. Uh, thanks for the question, Park Felix. So, as I sort of said uh, previously, the the Australian government, um, you know, the state government actually you know, funds schools, so they are responsible for the operations of, of schools as well. In terms of what they do in relation to health and, and sanitation, is that, uh, as you'd expect in terms of institutions in, uh, you know, say for example, in this case, reopening schools, or the, you know, the things you expect that you see here in terms of you know spacing in terms of masks in terms of testing in terms of sanitation those are all uh, funded and supplied uh, by by the government but there are a few spe specific things that are done in schools so things around providing regular testing and free regular testing for teachers uh, and students uh, parents and school leaders is a very important part of keeping schools safe and keeping it open. But while we want to keep the, the school open, we also want to make sure there is freedom of movement as well. Um, so there are kind of different rules in terms of if you're a close contact, um, if you're working in the school setting or if you're a student. So, you know, uh, and, and these policies change quite frequently as well. And I, mean, I haven't really kept up to take to the latest Australian government policy in relation to this. But what I do understand is from a close contact perspective, if uh, you are a close contact but you don't have any symptoms and you test negative, uh, you can still come back to school if you're a teacher, if you're a student. And that is all done with the purpose of what I said earlier, which is to keep schools open uh, first and closed last in case there's any kind of restrictions. And fortunately, uh, we haven't seen uh, any more restrictions uh, applied more lately, although you know, we are sort of in the midst of a, another uprising in terms of uh, the, the, the new COVID um, variant. But you know, those policies are, are quite fast moving and ultimately it is up to the states and territories and their governments decide what to do with these type of policies. But the support is there and additional funding is there also. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much, Mr. Han. Um, and now we have another question from Amira. Uh, Amira is asking a question to Catherine. Um, what are the UNICEF priority programs to address the impact of COVID-19 pandemic? Well, thank you so much for the, for the question, um, Pak Iwan, and thank you, um, Imira, as well. Um, you know, I think perhaps I'd like to sort of maybe reflect on kind of the fact that we, the work that we do, we do in partnership. Mm -hmm. So when we say UNICEF programs, I mean, we certainly have a whole lot of work um, that we're doing, but we can't do any of that work if we don't work in partnership. Mm -hmm. So this is why, you know, I, again, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the Ministry of Education, um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the great people we're working with um, at the subnational government level as well. Because, and also, I, I would have to say, we're working a lot with civil society organisations mm. to actually implement the work that we're doing. So, I'd like to acknowledge those 
partners first um, in answering this question. Um, secondly, I would say that you know all of the things I've mentioned before in terms of really trying to um, ensure that we understand where out-of-school children are, how we can help them, and actually work with government partners to address their needs so that they can return to learning in some form, whether that's back to formal school or um, for some sort of um, non-formal you know, um, education um, pathway is really, really important. Um, I would also say again that our early grade learning work um, is very important and while I mentioned Papua, we're also working in other areas in the eastern part of Indonesia in that. And this is something that you know, we feel is a great priority, particularly under the current circumstances. And the, the other pillar I will mention of, of area of work that we we really would, you know, we're doing, but we'd also really love the opportunity to kind of expand um, is the work we're doing in uh, early childhood education mm. and development. Um, in fact, we are supporting uh, the, the, the government of Indonesia's um, significant prioritisation of holistic and integrated early childhood development. Um, we know that the, the, the government actually, you know, um, really have prioritised this as, a, as an approach. And what we mean by that is that we not only support our um, partners, whether it be you know, local government or actually in ECD centres, teachers and parents. So it's not just focusing on education. It's really focusing on the whole aspect of development that a child really you know, needs support with. So it's, it's um, things like health, it's mm -hmm. nutrition, it's protection, it's water and sanitation. All of these things come together to um, be very, very important factors that underpin, you know, the, the development of children. So this is an area of work that, you know, I think both in, in Indonesia is, is really important and we'd love to work more on with, with um, the ministry, particularly because I think the ministry um, is really very much focused on trying to at least assure that, you know, all children age, age six, you know, have some kind of uh, early childhood education before they progress to primary. So if we can try to help um, you know, the ministry and the country more broadly to achieve that goal, we would be very, very um, you know, happy to be, to be working with you um, in that work. Um, and like I said before, investment in early childhood is so critical and is such an impactful investment. And I think for Indonesia context, it's probably one of the areas that probably needs you know, more investment and more, more kind of real focus um, in to push forward. Um, and I think, yeah, and then I think the other, the other thing to say in the work that we're doing is that we always try to uh, work in a way that is quite holistic. So um, while we are very much focused on trying to support teachers and students um, to learn, to teach and to learn the fundamentals, uh, we also are really concerned to make sure that there are other elements that come into play and whether that's sort of psychosocial support work, whether that's sort of, you know, um, supporting, you know, health work. And in fact, we've been doing a lot of work um, with the ministry and I know in conjunction, the ministries have been working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health on, um, you know, promoting, you know, vaccination and also, you know, working w to try and make sure that, you know, schools can open safely. So. Uh, UNICEF has been very happy to be involved in supporting some of the analytical mm -hmm. um, information and data collection work to support that very important nationwide planning. So yeah, no, I think these are, these are sort of the areas that we wish to continue and I think are even more important because of the pandemic. And I also think, you know, there are investments in system transformation as well. Thank you. System transformation. Indeed. Yeah, just like another opening for... <laughs> Indeed. And that's why I stopped there, because I think that's probably another hour. So, yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Catherine. Uh, Sahabat Dikbud, unfortunately, I think uh, we are uh, about to end this uh, session, the webinars of uh, Silaturami Merdeka Belajar. Uh, again, I'd like to say very honored to have Mr. Han and Ms. Catherine uh, to be with us today. But before we close the session for this afternoon, I'd like to, uh, to give uh, the chance to Mr. Han to, uh, for a closing statement. Please, Mr. Han. Well, uh, thank you, Park Ewan. And, and first of all, I'd just like to say um, 
express my gratitude for, for, for the invite and to participate on, on this panel. I've learned a lot today, uh, you know, from, from Catherine and from yourself in terms of, you know, the, the important work that's happening in, in this space. But in terms of that closing statement, I think what I'd like to highlight is that from the conversation today, it is very clear the importance of the transition back to face-to-face -face learning. It is a huge difference in terms of the well-being of students and the learning outcome of students. So now is a very important time that we provide the right and adequate and strong support to our teachers and to school leaders to ensure they have the adequate resources to enable them to deliver that education appropriately and effectively and address those learning losses in certain countries and address those wellbeing issues suffered by all students as, as well as teachers. I'd also like to make a statement around Australia's involvement with uh, our support, continuous support for Indonesia's education uh, framework and the advancement of Indonesia's education system both at the primary, secondary and tertiary levels and we look forward to working with Park E1 and the team as part of your G20 year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Mr Han. Ms Catherine? Well, thank you so much. I mean, I, I, I agree with um, Mr Hahn. It's been an incredibly rich discussion. Um, so thank you so much, firstly, for inviting um, myself, UNICEF, to be part of such a discussion. Um, I also just really wanted to acknowledge um, the excellent leadership um, for, from Indonesia on G20, because I think a lot of these very um, significant and complicated issues around education um, are really coming to the fore in that dialogue. So I really, I really want to thank you for your leadership, particularly um, Pak Uwan, in that. Um, and I would really like to just perhaps reiterate just the importance of face-to-face -face learning and getting children back to school. Mm -hmm. um, like we've mentioned, it's very exciting because we have the new school year starting. Um, I really want to encourage um, all the students, all the teachers, all the parents, communities, everyone, um, let's mobilise together, let's go back in really a positive way and in a supported way and really um, catch up on our learning and, and let's, let's just continue to grow, you know. So, but thank you so much. It's been a really delight to, to join you this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Catherine, Mr. Han. Terima kasih banyak. Uh, it's been, for me, a privilege to learn from both of our guests for today. Uh, Mr. Han, it's just like, um, for me, opening also the complexity of Australian context, but also uh, the possible solutions that can inspire us, maybe rethinking about some of the solutions, because again, we have 514 going to 517 local government. <laughs> <laughs> and Ms. Catherine, you provide us with the global context and see like w where the world is heading and what, what is actually actual very important for us uh, when we look at the, the global perspective, uh, and I think it, it, it's really like a very rich uh, learning experience for me and hopefully for Sahabat Dikbud semua. Now I'll switch to Bahasa Indonesia again. Um, <coughs> jadi ada beberapa hal, poin yang mungkin bisa saya tekankan di akhir uh, sesi uh, Silaturahmi Merdeka Belajar kita pada sore hari ini. Pertama, ayo kita utamakan uh, pendidikan dalam konteks pemulihan. Jadi kembalikan anak-anak ke sekolah, ini penting sekali untuk anak-anak bisa kembali ke sekolah melakukan pertemuan tatap muka walaupun mungkin masih dalam konteks uh, protokol kesehatan yang masih terbatas tapi sangat penting tadi dari Mr. Han dan uh, Miss Catherine menyebutkan banyak sekali poin-poin yang uh, uh, penting sehingga ini bisa mengakselerasi untuk pemulihan pembelajaran. Nah, lalu pentingnya dalam hal ini semua pihak saling mendukung. Uh, misalnya vaksinasi ya. Vaksinasi ini menjadi sangat penting buat kita semua, terutama untuk pendidik dan tenaga pendidikan dan juga untuk lansia. Uh, minimal bisa sampai 80%, kalau bisa 100%, pendidik dan tenaga pendidikan sudah divaksinasi atau lansianya 60% atau lebih ke atas itu sebenarnya angka yang cukup uh, safe untuk kemudian melakukan pertemuan tatap muka. Uh, lalu kemudian tadi ada satu uh, quote yang sangat menarik bagi saya, uh, dan ini menunjukkan komitmen dalam konteks Australia. Tadi Mr. Han bilang, schools itu the first to open and last to close. Jadi kalau ada apa-apa tuh yang duluan buka itu bukan mall, bukan tempat-tempat yang lain, tapi adalah sekolah dulu gitu loh. Dan yang kemudian yang terakhir ditutup itu sekolah justru, bukan yang pertama ditutup sekolah, sementara yang tempat yang lain masih buka. Itu uh, bukan sekedar retorika ya, tapi ini uh, hal yang kita pelajari dari konteks Australia dan juga di konteks negara-negara lainnya. Again, 
schools itu the first to open and last to close. Itu sangat luar biasa. Menurut saya simple tapi menunjukkan komitmen dan mudah-mudahan uh, kita dan semua uh, di pemerintah daerah juga bisa untuk berprinsip yang sama. Ketika anak-anak kembali ke sekolah, poin saya yang ketiga, maka pertama fokusnya kepada kompetensi fondasi. Jangan langsung semuanya di, di apa namanya di di di, 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 di gitu ya karena udah ketinggalan. Jadi pelan-pelan dulu. Tadi fokusnya kepada literasi, numerasi dan uh, saya menyebutnya karakter. Tadi Miss Catherine bilangnya 21st century skills. Ini mungkin bagian dari karakter. Uh, di kita ada profil pelajar Pancasila tersebut. Lalu juga fokusnya kepada mental health support karena kan anak-anak ini udah lama nggak sekolah dan sebagainya butuh kita melihat kondisi sosial emosionalnya jadi jangan langsung ngerjain soal gitu ya atau ngapa apa gitu yang modul-modulnya tapi uh, sosial emosional dulu yang didukung dan juga lakukan dan ini sangat penting sekali mudah-mudahan sahabat dikbu terutama bapak ibu guru di sekolah-sekolah lakukan asesmen awal jadi asesmen awal lihat kondisi anak-anaknya seperti apa mungkin udah lama nggak uh, kembali ke sekolah begitu di sekolah mungkin kita perlu lakukan asesmen awal itu mudah-mudahan bagi saya ini serentak ya kita lakukan sama-sama di seluruh sekolah di Indonesia tahun ajaran baru kita lakukan asesmen awal dan kemudian itu menjadi data yang digunakan oleh sekolah untuk terus uh, dipantau sehingga anak-anak bisa uh, belajarnya sesuai dengan uh, tingkat kesulitan atau kondisi atau kebutuhan mereka dan terakhir Tentunya kita nggak akan mungkin bisa melakukan ini semua tanpa spirit gotong royong. Jadi Bapak Ibu, sahabat dikbud semuanya, yuk kita gotong royong dengan prinsip tadi yang yang pertama. Kita harus utamakan pendidikan dalam pemulihan uh, pandemi ini. Schools itu first to open and last to close. Demikian dari saya uh, pada sore hari ini. Terima kasih orang sabar banyak pahala jika malu mukanya merah. Sudah panjang lebar kita semua berbicara, mohon maaf sekiranya ada yang salah. Sampai bertemu di Selatu Rami, Merdeka Belajar Selanjutnya. Saya Iwan Charil, mohon pamit. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam Merdeka Belajar.